All right, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to share with you uh, our progress with uh, high-speed modulation uh, for with thin film lithium uh, So this is a so I will show you through this talk that how uh, fundamental innovations on the device level could impact um, how we do optical networking for the AI uh, infra uh, in uh, in uh, infrastructure. So. Really fundamentally, what we're looking for here is that we believe that for the future that we need to go to higher speed per lane. Uh, so for example, 448 gig per lane optics. The reason for this is it's, that it's fundamentally filled by the bandwidth requirements for AI infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, the benefit of going to higher speed is that you're gonna use less component. It's half of the components for compared to 224 and it's quarter component compared to 112. Uh, so if you have less component, you have less issues, so which means, and we've heard this from many speakers in this conference, that uh, reliability is the key. So you'll have higher reliability, lower costs, and also potentially lower energy consumption depending on our architecture, but you could have better amortization of your component's energy if you have higher uh, sp uh, speed. The other really important point is that going to a higher speed is, uh, is also supported by existing ecosystems, so which means faster time to market. That's also very important, and again, uh, reliability and cost because there's a mature supply chain that we can leverage. Um, so if you look at the bandwidth requirement to go to 448 gig uh, per lane, uh, we can get uh, the conclusion that for, uh, for, uh, for, IM, for IMDD formats of PAM4, we need about 112 gigahertz analog bandwidth, and for 1.6 ZR, um, which is related, uh, that uh, we would need to run it at 200, possibly 260 gigabaud which means the 130 gigahertz analog bandwidth. Uh, so that poses challenges for the, uh, for the existing uh, materials, for example, for silicon. Um, so for silicon photonics, uh, currently the analog bandwidth is uh, it's difficult to achieve beyond 70 gigahertz. Uh, you also have insertion loss challenges and dry voltages. Uh, so this is what makes, and you have to do actual work on the electronic side to compensate for these uh, non-ideal optical performances. Um, for indium phosphite, I think the performance is better, but for indium phosphite, uh, the assembly yields and costs are to be a challenge when you go to A channels or more. Uh, so this is where the opportunities for, uh, for uh, the thin film lithium albate comes in, that we can actually achieve an analog bandwidth of 220 gigahertz, so that's already measured. And uh, we can at the same time achieve less than 3 dB optical insertion loss, low drive voltage, so drive voltage about 0.5 to one volt, so that's CMOS uh, level of drive, so you don't need an external driver. And most importantly, uh, I will talk to you more about the slides that there's a way to s manufacture this. There's a fundamentally sc scalable man manufacturing with thin film lithium albate. So the, uh, the point is that thin film lithium is ready to support greater than 130 gigahertz uh, analog bandwidth and beyond. So what is thin film li uh, lithium albate photonics? So this technology uh, appears in the late 2010s uh, in uh, in first university research labs, and then now in the more last five years, it started to get wider recognition in the industry. So the bulk material listing now, is actually being used in the industry for many, many decades. Those are used at the end of optical fibers for long distance communications for submarines. So those are actually used in very reliable, stable environment, and then they've been running, they will run there for 20 years without having a single problem, uh, because that's a requirement for the submarine ca uh, cables. Now, the innovation that happened in the last few years was really translate this technology from the bulk form into the thin film form. And what that means is that you can basically fabricate waveguides in this material just like how you would do it in silicon photonics. But the difference with silicon photonics is that this material is intrinsically electro-optic. That's where the analog uh, performance com uh, com uh, com uh, coming from. And what we have developed now is that not only that it's conceptually similar, but you can also employ similar manufacturing technologies as CMOS. Uh, so what our approach here is that we directly fabricate uh, lithium now with um, waveguides and, uh, and, uh, and other components, passive components on the chip so that we can build a fully integrated functional transmitter on the chip that with all this performance benefit. Uh, so here's an example of um, a chip that we made and then it's been uh, used in a transceiver demonstration. In this case was a 800G, so this is actually four by 200. Um, so the bit error rate here, so, so the, the eye diagram here is showing uh, 200 gigabits eye. Now, uh, this chip has eight channels and then the chip size is about five by nine millimeters, so it's comparable to silicon photonics. 
Now, we believe that the current technology can already support 1.6 uh, terabits per millimeter line short on density, so that's, that's pretty uh, sufficient for what we have now, but it can be further shrinked uh, if you use advanced integration tech, uh, tech, uh, technologies. We also see that the BER was less than 1E minus 11 when all channels are on at 200G, so this is the best performance among SIFO, indium phosphide, and lysine albate, and this fundamentally originates from the intrinsic material benefit. Uh, and then the, really the, the most uh, uh, important part is that actually the same chip, the very same chip, would support 8 by 100, 8 by 200, and also 8 by 400 in the future. So uh, the reason is because the extraordinary analog per, uh, performance. So what I'm showing you here is two types of modulators that we made. The first type is a single-ended electro-optic mod, uh, uh, modulator. Uh, so you can see that this is the electro-optic roll-off up to 110 gigahertz. This is measured data. It's very close to what we expect theor theoretically. So we have a really good understanding of how that behaves, the analog parts behaves. Now the right part is actually uh, the measured differential uh, response for a transmitter for the actual chip that I showed you in the previous slides, the analog performance there. So this actually we measured multiple chips. In this case, it's two chips, so two by eight channels. So what you see here is that their electro-optic response basically laid exactly on top of each other. That with only the difference is basically buried in the noise of the measurement. So what this really means is that you can get this kind of extraordinary analog performance in a very scalable manufacturing way, and you may not even have to worry about the tests when you have so many channels at those extraordinary frequencies. And that has been a major roadblock for these uh, high-speed uh, high an analog parts. Um, so we actually used these um, modulators to do, um, so as I mentioned, we did this for both 100G, 200G, and 400G per lane. So what you're seeing here is that the top is the electrical eye, uh, now these are generated by a Keysight uh, signal generator, so they're not, uh, uh, you know, they, they may not represent the, the eye of the DSP, but what the importance shows here is that the optical eye basically is a faithful replica of the electrical eye because of the extraordinary bandwidth performance. So this means that when a 400G electronics are ready, the optics would be ready to support it. So in fact, we actually did a model for the 400G performance based on the current manufacturing assembly process of the transceivers. Uh, so this is actually assuming a wire bond. So this is actually being extra conservative. So you don't have to use, introduce this complicated assembly techniques yet. Uh, and we can show that we still have ample uh, margins that to support this kind of bandwidth. And then that's originates from the extra margins that you get from the analog performance of the optics part. So for the manufacturing, uh, so we are working with the TR1 foundry. So we have introduced this process actually in this fab actually a few years ago. So we've been running now for quite a period of time. So this is a high volume production line. It can mix millions of chips a year. Uh, and uh, we'll also make sure that these uh, production line has no single point of failure. So this is ready to go. Um, so in short, uh, we believe that uh, thin film leasing orbit is critical to enable 3.2T, 6.4T, and 1.6T ZR optics in this sort of timeline that the industry really wanted. Um, and uh, the, the poor core benefit is that the current technology can already support 8 by 400 and possibly 16 by 400 to go up to 6.4T. Uh, the really important, the low insertion loss means that it requires less of number of lasers, again, better reliability, lower cost, and then the low voltage uh, means that there's, uh, it can be supported by direct drive by DSP. And again, that's lower power and lower components and the higher reliability. Uh, and an 8 by 400 GTX is basically ready today from the photonic side. Now for 1.6 EZR, uh, the, um, uh, the high analog bandwidth would really require 260 gigabaud, which is really extraordinary analog bandwidth requirements. And then the low insertion loss and low voltage, it's possible to enable a ZR link without EDFA, and that would be uh, really important with, with long, long enough reach for kind of uh, lower power uh, links. So the call to action is that, you know, as Vlad mentioned, that the, the uh, you know, it's never really easy to introduce a new material. In this case, actually, the material is not completely new, but the fabrication technology is relatively new. So what we ask, uh, you know, we, I would like to ask the industry is to consider that the differentiated advantage of this high bandwidth component, what could this do? Uh, to meet this kind of AI infrastructure requirement for extraordinary uh, bandwidth, fast time to market, and uh, reliability from the inherent simplicity of this approach. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, and to consider adopt Team Film Nishinabe because that's the, the, uh, the first step uh, to support a rapid growth now and also beyond 400G. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, I hope the industry, uh, the community considers different components for addressing some of the OCP projects. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. We have time for one question from the audience. Ali, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, quick question. Uh, so are you de depositing the you know, tin film lit in Naibe with like, like depositions or how you? Yeah, that's a great question. So these wafers are actually commercially available. So the, the manufacturing process is exactly the same as uh, SOI the process. The silicon wafer? Or the the lithium-albid uninsulator wafer. So okay. instead of SOI, silicon insulator, you have lithium-albid insulator. So and these wafers are very widely used for the uh, cell phone market. So that's why they are available in high volume. Okay, so you're using existing, so that's, so you don't have to do the deposition. No, you no, buy. correct. The only thing that you would have to do would be patterning, you know, etching down. Correct. Put the, uh, the tr you know, basically, uh, uh, the wave guide, right? Yes, okay. yes, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how many suppliers of wafers uh, are on the market? Right now we have more than three. More than three? Correct, All right. yes. Yes, All there's right. more, more and more people are seeing this opportunity and are emerging. Yeah. Three years ago it was one, I think. Correct, yes. Yeah. yes. All right, thank you very much, Miyang. I think we're gonna take a short coffee break and then we're gonna reconvene at, uh, in 15 minutes. <laughs>